for the two class webinar series the uh, from the this is uh, organized by video heritage center for gerontology for the uh, department of social work bharati dasan university tiruchirappalli india in collaboration with heritage foundation hyderabad and pass it on net network and uh, welcome you to all to this session we are so delighted to have all of you on this uh, virtual platform this has been a webinar series we had a very lively session yesterday uh, where dr jan hively uh, made a very inspiring presentation uh, and we had a wonderful discussion i'm sure you all might have had very fruitful um, you know learning experiences today and today we are going to have and moro i'm just trying to get my you know screen um, visible make it make my screen visible there seems to be some Professor Lengo, from what I can tell, I think your computer is um, still trying to download the PPT, and that's what's slowing everything down. I mean, if it's okay, I can share from my computer, and and um, we can move forward that way. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry. Sorry. There seems to be a lot of difficulties with the internet connectivity here. Yeah, but anyway, that's only a difficulty from my side. But I think that should not be a problem for the session because even yesterday we experienced this difficulty. Uh, I'm just trying to. Uh, share the screen the entire program your department, department of social work bardidas university and about uh, uh, the past on network the speakers dr jan hively who made an excellent presentation yesterday and uh, today's presenter dr rajiv mehta and uh, ms moy allen uh through a small ppt uh but uh, the um, uh, the meeting uh, you know connection goes out so i'm sure i think it should not be a problem for us so without uh, delaying further i think uh, i'll just make a brief introduction of for the speaker today um we have rajiv mehta yeah uh we have uh, rajiv mehta He is a founder and ceo of california based non profit atlas of care for the past 15 years rajiv's work has focused on helping people care for themselves and their families run pilot study serving as its principal investigator which led to the founding of a very unique uh, project called atlas of care he has developed the award winning personal health product and lectured and consulted widely on consumer health previously rajiv had led uh, innovation and new business development at 
technology companies, including uh, he studied business at Columbia. He did his MBA there and aerospace engineering at Stanford, uh, Stanford and Princeton. And he sits on the board of Family Caregiver Alliance and he's an advisor to the quantified staff itself. He was recognized as a two. 2018 influencer on aging by PBS affiliate Next Avenue. Firing and very impressive uh, uh, by data. I think it uh, it will take a lot of time if I start you know uh, mentioning all the credentials. So welcome Rajiv. So I I think uh, Rajiv is ready with his uh, 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 talk uh, presentation. Uh, over to you, Rajiv. Moira, did you want to say a few words at the start? You're muted right now. Okay, I'm just going to um, introduce, not introduce because you've just had the bio of uh, Rajiv, but just to tell you very quickly how the Parsiton Network has come to know Rajiv. Um, at Parsiton Network, our mission is to work towards a world where everybody has full and meaningful lives right through to the end in a give and take, take caring community. And this whole thing about a caring community is where we got to know Rajiv. In fact, our relationship with him goes back to 2017 when we were all doing a worldwide uh, a webinar, in fact, a whole series of webinars on caregiving. And that's where we met uh, Rajiv and learned about his incredible work, which puts the senior in the center of the caregiving situation. And um, from that, we've been working with him and the Pasadon Network has been growing. And we've been gathering more and more experts like Rajiv. And our big question now is how can we use these contacts that we have to turn the knowledge that these people have into action? And that's where the Parsiton Network has been stepping up its collaboration with uh, Rajiv. And we're busy doing three very interesting pilot projects about the caregiving map in South Africa, in Kenya, and in Canada. And we aim to work steadily with Rajiv into the future and learn more about this whole vital field of caring and the seniors. And I think that's all that I would like to say from us. Thank you very much. Rajiv, over to you. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's hope my, my slides are presentable. So, um, it's hopefully... Um, Um, just can someone speak up and say whether they're able to hear me and see the slides? Because I can't. Um, anybody else? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can see you. We can hear you. It's audible. Okay, great. Yeah, there we go. All right. So um, the the title of my talk, as you can see, is uh, Mapping Ourselves, which is a, a program that we have developed to really help uh, communities take better care of themselves. And I just want to start by, you know, asking this question, rhetorical question of what is a community? Um, you know, to some people, it's just a group of people that happen to be in the same place. But I think it's much more fundamental than that. A community is a place that you feel you belong to. So the sense of belonging is really, really important. Um, you feel you belong in this community and you know that everyone else accepts you as part of that. And so in a community, people really care for each other, care about each other. And that's what really makes something a community. And so what we've been focusing on is that issue of care, not only in kind of a, a relatively narrow medical sense of caring for our sick family members, but care as fundamental uh, to being human. And so what I'm going to show you today is the work we've been doing to both research this and to help people take better care of themselves. And just to be clear, I'm gonna be sharing with you some of what I have experienced and what I understand today, but I am still learning. And so no doubt some of what I tell you today will be wrong. 
And so I welcome your, your questions and even your critiques. It's the only way to make further progress. Um, so just a, a simple outline of the talk, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the organization that I lead, this nonprofit based in California, then tell you about this program that we have developed called Mapping Ourselves. And most recently, our work has focused on a project in the state of Michigan in the U.S., and I'll tell you about that. And just wrap up with where we're taking this work as we move forward. Um, so uh, Professor Ilango mentioned my background, but just to summarize, I, I did grow up in, in Bombay when I was very young, did my you know KG through five over there, um, but then or have lived in the U.S. ever since. So I uh, grew up in New Jersey. I went to Princeton and Stanford to study aeronautics, and then later on went to Columbia to get a business degree. And so my professional background has also been very varied over the years. Um, in the 80s, I was a research scientist for NASA out here in California. And then for the next 15 or so years, I was in the technology industry out here in Silicon Valley at companies like Apple and Adobe and, and others. So a lot of the work was developing very, very new technologies and bringing them uh, to the market. So I can take some credit for the development of digital cameras, for example. But for the last 15 years, my focus has very much been on care in the sense of how do we people care for ourselves, our families, our communities. And um, for the last decade almost, I've been on the board of an organization called the Family Caregiver Alliance, which is one of the most prominent nonprofits in the U.S. focused on family care. And then since 2016, I, I founded and lead uh, this nonprofit called Atlas of Care, which I'll i tell you a little bit more about right now. And some people may wonder how did and you know, a NASA engineer go into uh, focusing on care? We'll just have to um, save that story for some other time. But it's important to note that all of that previous experience at NASA, at Apple and so forth, has in fact been critical to the work that I and my colleagues have been doing around care, as you might see in some of the work. So to um, tell you a little bit about Atlas of Care, I'll start the story in 2014, where I organized a, a roundtable of experts from across the US on this topic of how do we increase support uh, for family care, uh, particularly what can we do in terms of technology? And so we had people from the healthcare industry, from government agencies, from uh, nonprofit organizations and so forth, all come together to talk about what do we know and what can we do. And one of the most important conclusions we came to was essentially how little we know. That hey, we had... Hello? Um, you know, how little we know that um, people are, uh, we have the experts in the room, but we acknowledge how little actual data we had on what people do from a day-to-day -day care perspective. Um, and that led to this major research study in 2015, uh, supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, where we tried really new approaches to studying family care in the home environment. And we used a lot of um, Silicon Valley technologies, a lot of new sensors, you know, James Bond type stuff, that little cameras that people wore, uh, devices on their wrists like a Fitbit. We also put sensors in their home to track movement and so forth. And we also did a lot of basic ethnography. We interviewed people, we had them keep logs and so forth. And in fact, discovered that it's possible to capture really rich data about day-to-day -day family care. And one of the most important things that we found was that the families themselves loved learning about themselves. That when we showed them these diagrams about what their lives looked like, um, they were often very surprised. Although they had been the ones who provided us with the data, they had never uh, taken the trouble to diagram their data and to step back and see what does it mean, because honestly, we're all too busy simply going by our day-to-day -day lives. And so we realized that if we could make it possible for anybody to explore their own life, to gather their own data, to visualize their own data, that that would be very powerful. And so that led us to, in fact, um, set up our team, um, the Atlas of Caregiving. And um, so I just want to briefly mention that we have 
these various people that are involved, and we have a very, very diverse background on our extended team. So there are people like myself, uh, Bill Potelli, Mike Bellissimo, Sandy Bennett, um, et cetera, who have been or are very senior executives and CEOs for Silicon Valley companies. But then there's other people like Kathy Kelly and Carol Levine, who are two of the foremost experts on family care in the U.S. Likewise, um, Don Nafis and Jan English Lueck are two of the top anthropologists in the U.S. Um, uh, Georgia Lupi is one of the world's uh, leading designers, and Doug Solomon was an executive at one of the top leading design firms, and also has been consulting to health. Uh, care institutions for nearly 50 years. And then uh, Susanna Fox was the chief technology officer for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and Ronnie Zeigers uh, leads health for Facebook. So it's a very diverse group of people, but with really deep experience in many, many ways that allows us uh, to do the work that we do. And so 2017-2018, one of the first things we did was we um, had this diagram that you can see a picture of someone drawing, which we call a care map, and I'll tell you more about it in a moment. And we did a lot of workshops teaching people how to draw this um, in Santa Barbara, California, and then really across the U.S. Uh, supported by AARP. And in fact, did a few of these workshops abroad. Um, and they turned out to be very, very impactful, far more powerful than we had imagined. So let me um, tell you briefly about the care map. I'm sorry so, to interrupt, but we're not seeing your presentation. You're not seeing the slides. We've got the tiny, the tiny view, not the big view. Moira, you let me, you're not able to see my slides. Just as the Just small, as small you know, in the small window, not in the bigger window. The PPT is not the PPT seen. Is not seen. Ah, well, that's not good. Uh, like, if I make this bigger, does it work? Moira? No. 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 Sir, that's green. Yeah. It, Rajiv, it was working well. Uh, it's not a problem because someone shared the screen and uh, disrupted. And oh. who wanted to turn it? Please turn it. Turn it. it yes, yeah, someone interrupted. Uh, let me try it again. It says resume. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You know, there is practically nothing we can do uh, uh, to prevent okay. people from interrupting. Ah, okay. So let me see. Are you able to to see this now? Yeah. What? Yeah, we are able. To Rajiv, see. it's coming up. Now. Rajiv, it's coming up. Yeah, make it full screen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So you're able to see this now? Yeah. It's wonderful. Visible, it's visible. Perfect. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Perfect. Yes. okay. Well, tell me again if it disappears. Sorry. Um, well, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. okay, so this care map, as you can see, is a diagram. It's a hand-drawn diagram of a people and who is caring for who in a particular family. No problem. And, uh, Sorry, it's so, not there yet. Not the, the, the circle's the showing that it's charged, but it's not, it's, it's not fully charged yet. Oh. So, so we're not seeing, and it's vital because you're going to show this drawing. So, this we've got. Yeah, there we see. go. I'm no, able Moira, to see. No, we are able to see. Moira, Moira, everybody is able to see. Rajiv, 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 Okay, should I continue? Yeah, please go I think ahead. You should continue. Yeah, please continue. Yeah, please continue. Okay. Yeah, please continue. Okay. So when people are drawing this drawing, they're trying to make a picture of their care ecosystem. Who are all the people involved and you know to what extent are different people caring for each other? And so as you draw it, the questions you ask yourself are 
who all am I caring for? So yes, you might be caring for your mother who is old and sick, but you might also have a pet dog who is sick right now, or you have a child who has hurt himself, and so you're caring for him. So you ask yourself, who all am I caring for? Who else is caring for them? And also, who is caring for me? And in the process, as you do the drawing, you usually start thinking of more and more people. And as you can see, we use different types of symbols, you know, stick figures, triangles, squares, uh, to represent different types of people. And then these arrows have particular meanings as well. The thicker the arrow, um, the more frequent the care is provided. It is really a question of frequency rather than what, who is more important or anything like that. It's a very easy thing to say, oh, this person comes and helps me 10 times a day, whereas I only see my doctor once every six months. So never mind how important the doctor is, the doctor only gets a dotted line because it's very infrequent. Whereas, you know, your, your daughter who helps you many times a day gets a very heavy line because she does things many times a day. So the, the diagram also emphasizes um, closeness, physical closeness. So the people in the same house are diagrammed together. The people nearby are near you on the page. And the people far away are on the edges of the paper. And these little circles um, kind of represent a, a sense of distance, how far away people are. So it's a very simple diagram, requires no drawing skills to do. In fact, this one was drawn by myself. And so it seems very simple, but it has turned out to be very powerful. So I'm going to move to the next slide. And somebody please let me know if you're able to see the next slide. Um, so this one is of a family out here in California. And you can see inside the house, there's Hannah and Gaston. It's a couple who are taking care of her brother named Harvey. And this diagram, just looking at it without worrying about the details, you can see how complex yes, care yes, is. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Great. You can see how complex care is. Almost everybody is uh, providing care, being a caregiver, and receiving care. And oftentimes they're caring for themselves as well. And this is a really, really important point to appreciate. Um, you know, especially in the field of aging and so forth, we talk about caring for the elderly, which is important and is something we do. And yet it really, it hides the fact that those older people are still very actively involved in caring for others. So the last time I saw my grandmother, my father's mother in Bombay, she was in her late 80s and physically very frail, but she was still on top of what was going on in the household and knew who needed to be talked to and so forth. So she was still very actively involved in caring for us just as much as we were caring for her. And so this idea that all of us are constantly caring is a very important one. And we recognize that care takes many forms. In this particular family, we have the, the person at the top of the diagram, H's brother. That's Hannah and Harvey's other brother. And he really helps out the family by providing money. And so he's not there putting on bandages or, you know, giving you a comfort in talking, but he does provide the family money. And that's really important for their well-being and so forth. So you can see that all sorts of care are represented. Now, it turns out that this, these diagrams can be learned by anyone. And so this particular care map was drawn by an eight-year-old boy. Um, I redrew it so that you could, you could see it more clearly, but the basic diagram was done by him. And uh, he had learned how to do it from his mother but then he really drew this by himself. Uh, he didn't want her help. And you can see in the middle of the screen that he lives in a house with his mother and his grandfather and his grandmother. And he, the boy, considers that he provides a lot of care to his grandfather. And his, um, his grandfather is short and fat and his grandmother is tall and skinny. And so that's how he has drawn them. And so this you know, gives you a sense of who he sees in his world. He's got his best friend Marco down at the bottom, but he also drew his cat with a little cloud 
And as, as it turns out, his cat had actually died uh, several years earlier. But the boy felt that his cat was still around, you know, watching him and taking care of him. And for his mother, seeing the boy's diagram and understanding how her son viewed the world was really, really important. And I just want to stress that um, these tools that we have been uh, developing are, in fact, being used by people of all ages. Uh, I know a in California, a second grade teacher who's been teaching all of her children how to draw these care maps. So they're simple but it turns out they're very, very powerful. And they ended up having an unexpectedly huge impact. And so much of the progress uh, that my research and, and my colleagues have made has been because of unexpected results. So one of the things that happened was with a group of, of uh, volunteers in Santa Barbara, California, that we were working with, and they said that learning the care map had a huge impact on their lives, that it was literally life-changing. And so we really spent a lot of time with them to understand what in the world could this diagram have caused such a change that you're so, so, um, so excited about it. And they told us how they had changed their lives from some of the things that they'd learned, that they had then gone on to teach uh, their family members and others in the community, how to draw them. And in fact, they had become such experts in doing this that they were considered the experts in their community on this. And they are the ones brought into hospitals and companies and things like that to teach others how to do this. And you need to appreciate how huge this is because these people that I'm talking about are not professionals. They're not experts of any sort. In fact, their day-to-day um, -day occupation is cleaning other people's houses. They're very poor people who somehow find time to volunteer for their communities. But in using this tool, they have been able to show their community how much they understand about people and about care. And it was really seeing this impact and how this had impacted a huge community that led to a lot of our work uh, last year, which was honestly to step back and say, what in the world happened? What have we learned over the last three, four years uh, that we can make some sense into? And so in 2019, we published a couple of books, uh, the blue ones you can see in the picture, uh, about what we've learned with the care map, and then started working on mapping ourselves, which is a, a much larger project. And I should just mention over here that all of these reports you see on the current screen are, are downloadable from our website. And so to summarize what we've learned in these five years, um, I have these four, these four points to make. One is that care is the heart of community. If you care, you know, if you want to improve uh, the resilience of a community, if you want to improve the fabric of the community so that it's a much stronger, you have to focus on care. You have to see how our people actually take care of each other. And one of the biggest challenges at the start is that first you have to find a way to see it. What we do to care for each other is essentially invisible. You don't pay for it. There's no menu of services. It's sitting down with a friend and having a cup of tea when they're not feeling so good. It's helping your grandmother find a book she wants to read. It's going over and making sure your neighbor is okay today. These things are hard to see. And so we have to learn how to see the invisible things that we do to care for each other. Um, if we don't learn to see, it's hardly likely that we'll be able to make improvements. So how can we see? And that's an approach that we call personal science. And personal science is, in some sense, no more complicated than using the idea of science, of observing the world, of gathering data, of making hypotheses, of making models, of experimenting um, to learn about the world. And in this, uh, many of the people on my team are part of a community, in fact, are leaders of a community called the Quantified Self. This is a very loose community of people around the world 
um, that is interested in essentially investigating and exploring their own lives to see what they can learn. And these photos you see on the bottom are from conferences uh, that we have led. So over the past decade, we have led 15 international conferences um, in North America and in Europe. But we have uh, groups around the world. There are several in India. And um, through these conferences, through these people, we are able to tap into the expertise of some brilliant people around the world. And so the tools we have developed are based not just on our own work, but really on the work of many, many people around the world. And then finally, through all of this, we've learned that like with those uh, volunteers in Santa Barbara that I mentioned, that the more that this learning is done as a group, the far more powerful it is. An individual who learns to sort of recognize his own life is a very good thing. But when you and your friends and your colleagues and your coworkers are all doing this together, you're able to tap into your collective wisdom. And that is far, far more powerful. So with these lessons is what we've developed, put into developing this program that we call Mapping Ourselves. And so at a very simple level, this Mapping Ourselves program is a class that we teach in which uh, participants learn some tools like the care map and methods to better observe and understand their own lives. And as I was just saying, part of what they're observing is how they are interconnected to each other. They're not looking solely at themselves, but they're looking at the ecosystem, the community that they exist within. And they're paying attention to how just day-to-day -day life has an impact on their well-being, on others' well-being. Um, the program is also fundamentally designed to allow people to really experience the value of learning with others. So you're not just all sitting in a classroom together. Almost all the learning happens because you're talking with each other. And in fact, the overall experience of the classroom has been very deeply designed. Um, it feels organic to the participants, but we have spent an enormous amount of time and effort to make it feel like there's no planning going on. So let me start by showing you uh, some of these tools. Um, the care map we is... Lost, lost, uh, Rajiv, we've uh, lost Rajiv, the we presentation lost again. again. Ah, well, yeah, thanks again. for saying that. I'll yeah, resume presenting. Um, where is it back? Yeah. It's yeah. charging. It's yeah. charging. It's charging. No, it's charging. No, it's okay, good. So um, I think it's showing up for some people quicker than for others, um, but yeah. so it goes. The, so the delay. The delay. We, we're teaching people these six tools as a starting point, and these are all pencil and paper tools, so colored pencils on paper. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I've done lots of products for companies like Apple. So my team really does know how to do computer things and apps and gadgets, but we are very consciously choosing uh, these old technologies of pencil and paper because they have their advantages too. So the care map is one tool. I told you about that one. The social network is a very different tool, much more abstract, that helps you analyze uh, the relationships within other sorts of communities. So your coworkers, or your bridge club, or any other group like that. Um, the conversations tool helps you pay attention to the various conversations you have over the course of the day. And in particular, to see how do they impact your mood, your energy? Do they leave you excited? Do they leave you drained? Uh, what do you talk about? And so forth. And it really is important to sort of pay attention to this sometimes because we human beings really live through our conversations. It's almost as if we don't really experience something until we can share it with someone. And so we help people understand how the conversations are impacting them. On the bottom left is this tool called Daily Activities, which uh, looks very unusual, looks like a, you know someone shot bullets at a dartboard. Um, and it's very purposely designed to not look like a calendar 
because in doing so, we help open up your mind to seeing other kinds of patterns in your day. And paying attention to daily activities is important. Uh, one of our uh, advisors, uh, Professor Jan English Lueck, is one of the experts on busyness in America. And part of what her research has shown is that almost everyone feels that they are too busy, and yet everyone's busyness is different. And examining what is busy in your life can teach you a lot about what it is that you are prioritizing in life and what your hopes and fears are for life. So we help people understand what their day looks like. Um, the environment tool um, is something that helps you pay attention to the spaces that you inhabit. How loud, how cluttered, how noisy, how smelly, how bright, uh, etc. are these spaces. And really, how is that space impacting how you feel and how focused you are? And this particular tool has been designed such that once you learn it, at any time you can just sort of scribble it on the corner of your notebook. And so it's meant to be something you can do in the moment, kind of a moment of meditation about your environment. And finally, the body connection tool is something that helps you pay attention to kind of the physical, emotional senses, uh, sensations as you go through the day. How hungry or thirsty are you? How, how tired are you? How focused are you? Etc. And so as a collection, these tools help you see um, your own world, to see the invisible of your world, especially your well-being, in many different ways. But I want to say uh, four key things about these tools. One is to st start with the obvious. They are unfamiliar to most people. This way of visual thinking is not something that most of us have been taught. And so there very much is a learning process at the beginning. Even the care map, as simple as it seems, can take years to really master. So they are unfamiliar, but we also point to sort of guarantee to people that if you take a little bit of time, you will discover that they are actually very simple, that you can learn the basics right away. I mean, honestly, those, those eight-year-olds, those second graders being able to do this shows that they're not very hard. Thirdly, by design, these tools are very, very flexible. Part of the reason for choosing pencil and paper is that it means you can draw whatever you want. You can make the tools more simple if that's appropriate. You can make them much more complicated if you want to. You can even sort of borrow visual elements from one tool and put it into another tool if that suits your needs. So they're very, very flexible by design. And this combination of simplicity and flexibility makes them, in fact, very powerful tools. And so talking about the flexibility also, as I said, we're teaching six tools, but in fact, we're teaching you a visual language that allows you to create your own tools as you go forward. And so the I'm second sorry, major... I'm sorry. Wonder why that keeps happening. Because some oh, you know, it because somebody, you know, somebody, in somebody, of, somebody yeah, in spite of our several announcements, people keep interrupting us interrupting by us. sharing uh, their screen. And, and there is practically nothing, nothing we can do to prevent them. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah. All right. Well, Moira, keep letting me know when it happens. <laughs> um. So. In addition to the tools, the more fundamental concept we're teaching people is this idea of personal science, that you, you yourself, not some scientist someplace, are able to explore anything in your life using a scientific approach. And we give people sort of full permission, as if they needed it, to modify the tools we're teaching them to suit their own needs. And then finally, this is harder to demonstrate, but I'm just making the point that the way we teach these classes are designed so that people really learn from each other rather than really from us. We do a minimal amount of lecturing and slides in these programs. Almost all of it is people speaking with each other. And we strongly encourage people outside of class to share their tools and learnings with their family, friends, and others. And they discover that almost all the learning really happens in these outside conversations 
not in the classroom. So this is very much by design. So let me, I'll switch now from talking about the program to what we've done with this in, in Michigan. So this is a project called We All Care Michigan. And for those of you who are not familiar with Michigan, it's a state in the US. It's the one outlined in red at the bottom there. Um, it's surrounded by all these big lakes and the city of Detroit, you know, known as the auto capital of the US for Ford and General Motors and so forth is, is a city in the state of Michigan. And in this project, we had a really wide range of organizations involved, really diverse on purpose. So let me tell you about them. Um, starting in the bottom right is the city of Detroit. And we had an organization called SRC, which is actually about 50 organizations in the Detroit area that all provide different kinds of services to seniors in that area. So they, they range widely, but they're all focused on supporting the senior community in and around Detroit. Uh, so social workers and healthcare workers and community health workers and so forth. Uh, nearby, uh, the city of Ann Arbor is home to the University of Michigan. So whereas Detroit is a very poor city, Ann Arbor is actually a very wealthy community and you know with a lot of academics and so forth. There we included two very different organizations. One was a company called Zingerman's. Zingerman's is actually a collection of about 10 or so restaurants in Ann Arbor. And so the kind of people participating there were really waitresses and cooks and people like that. We also had an organization called Temple Beth Emmet, which is a Jewish synagogue in, in Ann Arbor. So just community members of the Jewish faith. Then in the middle of the state, in the city of Lansing, which is the state capital, we included uh, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. So a huge government agency focused on health and well-being, as well as a company, a nonprofit called Hospice of Michigan, which provides hospice services across the state. And then finally, on the upper left is a very different place. It's the city of Fremont, uh, but you need to understand that this is a very, very rural community. So the city of Fremont is all of 4,000 people, you know, less than the population of my tiny little neighborhood in Bombay. And there we were working with high school students as well as some local health and community leaders. So very much by design, we had a very diverse group of people taking this um, in our Mapping Ourselves program. And really it was that we were doing this as an experiment, an exploration really, that how would different sorts of people respond to this program? Would they find it valuable? And it, it was very much an exploration in the sense that we were actively trying to make things as diverse and varied as we could to identify different things, rather than having an experimental methodology where we were completely consistent with everyone. So at the start of this year, we began doing several in-person classes. Uh, some of these were run as a workshop meaning people were with us for the whole day for eight hours. For some people, we taught them as a series, meaning every month we'd have a two-hour session. We'd teach a little bit, then they'd go off and, and do things. And you can see from these photos uh, that there are you know, just different people involved. Um, the top photo, the woman in the back is actually a doctor. Uh, the woman in the front in the pink shirt, she's a very senior social worker. Whereas... Um, in the middle picture around the big round tables, this was, uh, you know, sort of the restaurant workers, the waiters, um, some of the, the restaurant owners and so forth who were participating in the project. And then down in the bottom photo are some of those high school students that I mentioned. The really great news from this part of the project was that nearly everybody just, just loved uh, the project. They loved being in these programs. They learned a lot about themselves. And honestly, 100% of them said that they would recommend the project to others. So we're very excited. And in fact, here are some quotes from the organizations we're working for. Christy King is the executive director of that uh, SRC, the organization around Detroit with the 50 social um, services organizations. 
and she was, you know, the, the project went better than she could have expected. Maria Gonzalez was uh, the foundation head for that very small community where the high school students were learning, and she was just so pleased with it. And to understand how well uh, the children liked the program, I should tell you that on one of the days that we were there to teach, the weather outside was really bad. It was snowing, and the temperature was minus 8 degrees Celsius, and yet one of the children rode his bicycle to come to the class because he didn't want to be late, and so didn't want to wait for the bus. So that's how dedicated they were. And similarly, this guy, Ari Weinzweig, who's the head of that restaurant business, has now started incorporating it into all of their work. So as far as an experiment was going, these were like fabulous uh, results. But of course, uh, COVID brought that to a halt. We couldn't keep doing in-person workshops. So in March and April, we really scrambled to figure out how could we turn this into an online program. And initially, this felt very difficult because so much of what we were doing in our class was the people interacting with each other and how are we going to replicate it online. Um, but we reached out to many experts on online training and really used some of their methods and created a five-part program where we had a weekly 75-minute session that people came to. And again, what we did was we made the time during the online session very, very interactive. It was very little of such slide presentations and almost entirely people talking with each other, sometimes in large groups, whereas you can see right now on the picture, and sometimes in very small groups of three to four people. And we took most of our instructional material, the videos or papers they had to read, and gave it to them to study on their own time in between the classes. And so all of their observations about their life, the drawing of care maps and other things were done outside of classes assignments. And to our complete surprise, the online program has proven to be far more powerful than what we were doing in class. It, you know, I, I was just so shocked, um, but you learn as you go. It turns out that one of the positive things about doing this online was that it, it basically forced a slower pace. We couldn't do it as a day-long workshop, but the, we broke it up into pieces, and people had time to think about things between classes, and that made a huge difference. The fact that we really emphasized interaction on the online sessions was really critical. And in fact, because people didn't have to come to a place, like with today's call, there were people from all over the state who were able to join. And as Moira mentioned at the beginning, in one of our programs, we had people from, you know, South Africa and Kenya and Paris and New Zealand and Singapore and Canada all participating simultaneously and really getting to know each other. And so that was what was really, really powerful. Of course, um, there were some downsides, um, internet problems, as we're experiencing over here. Uh, many people didn't have printers at home, and so sometimes they had a hard time with some of the materials. And of course, we lost the human touch of being able to see and smell and just feel each other and be able to do things on a whiteboard together. But despite that, as I said, the online program turned out to be far more powerful. Um, and to just sort of summarize the key observations was people were really able to learn the tools. So if that had been a question at the beginning, are these uh, learnable? The answer was very much so. Also, the tools turned out to be very valuable. Many people gained real clarity on their lives. And some people had really major insights into their lives. Uh, very dramatic just like those volunteers in Santa Barbara that I told you about earlier. People uh, recognize the strong value of learning together, that this was very much a community learning rather than individual learning. And we also had what we call strong ripple effects. Just through the course of the program, people without really a lot of encouragement from us were already teaching it to others, to their sisters, to their family members, to their coworkers, and we're already modifying the tools to suit their purposes. And finally, 
you know, as I mentioned, we had a diverse group of people in the program. Uh, these high school students, the youth, uh, business executives, social workers, and everybody uh, found it valuable. And it makes the point that it's about your being a human being, not about your job title. Caring is something that we humans do, not what social workers or doctors or, you know, just any particular profession does. To care is human. Finally, in terms of the tools, um, there were always some people who found a particular tool valuable. Uh, you know, so for some people, the, the environment tool might look very strange. I don't know what to do with this. And somebody else would talk about how useful it was for them. And then hearing other people talk about how they found value, people were able to also think about how it might be useful for them. And the result of that was that almost everyone expects to use all six tools again sometimes in their life. Um, the care map kind of stands alone. Everyone seems to love that one. Just it doesn't seem to take much to get there. And the last two observations was to make a very obvious point, perhaps. But as simple as these tools are, learning them deeply does not happen instantly. It's just like with learning yoga or meditation or design or anything else. You can take a week-long class, and now you know the basics. But to really become a master at that takes a long time. And similarly, we've discovered that teaching of these tools is also not as easy as it looks, that people who have deeply understand the material are able to teach it much more rapidly than people who have just learned it. It's somewhat saying the obvious, but people sometimes are are uh, distracted by how simple the tools seem. And finally, we had a very interesting uh, appreciation of how people's own mindsets um, sometimes helped or prevented them from taking full advantage of this. So there are many people there who are what we think of as rule followers. They work and they follow the rules exactly. Um, so to, you know, some social workers are told, do this and they will follow the rules exactly. Whereas others will learn it and then they will apply it as they think is right for the family that they're serving. So those people with that flexible mindset learned so much more and were able to use these tools so much more than the ones who like following the rules. And so just to close with what we're doing next, um, the immediate next steps is we're, um, of course, continuing to improve all of the materials as well as the class design. In fact, one of the things we're doing in improving the class design is we've discovered a way to both scale it in the sense that we can easily teach hundreds and thousands of people at a time through the classes that we lead online, but while we can also help local organizations finally tailor the material for their audience. And so we call it this five by five format, and we're working on that to help um, take big classes, but also for each community to be able to do their own. And we're now actively beginning to collaborate with a really wide range of organizations to strengthen and empower their communities. Um, so we're working with a lot of health services and social services organizations, but I need to add the point that we're working with these organizations if they're interested in first learning it for themselves before using it for their clients or their patients. Uh, we just make the point that, you know, if teachers are teaching something, they better understand it themselves first. And in this case, it's you human beings need to understand it for yourself before you try to teach others. So health and services organizations were really for their own people first. We're working with various businesses, uh, communities in the sense of towns and things, and then also in schools, given how positive the reaction was from the children. And then longer term, we're just looking at, um, we're very much coming to appreciate that these ideas of mapping ourselves and personal science are very, very fundamental ideas that are, you know would benefit from universal adoption. And so we're reaching out to all sorts of organizations in the U.S. and abroad uh, to collaborate, to bring it out in a very wide sense. And we'll continue to 
improve and expand the tools and, and sort of drive innovation and care. So that's it for my slides. Hopefully we got through that okay. And um, Moira, I'll turn it over to you or I'm happy to take questions or... Thank you. Yes, I, Thank you very much, uh, you very much uh, for that uh, wonderful, presentation. wonderful presentation. It was very inspiring. Very inspiring. You know, as a social worker, I was reminded of one of the techniques which we use for you know mapping the social interaction among people, which was developed long ago by J. L. Moreno, uh, called sociometry. And you know, uh, the, the whole idea of mapping care available for the elderly is fantastic, and. Uh, uh, through your presentation, we could understand that, you know, seeing is believing. As you rightly talked about, you know, seeing. I think when you see what uh, people get in terms of care and who provides the care in the form of, a, you know, a visual uh, representation, I think it really makes a lot of sense. So that was wonderful, uh, Rajiv. And I'm particularly, you know, very much impressed by the ideas of leveraging collective capacity, how we have to, you know, really uh, leverage the collective capacity and uh, the whole idea of mapping ourselves is, I think, mapping the, you know, whole care uh, givers and uh, all these systems of care that are available uh, is very crucial when it comes to elder care. So thank you so much, uh, uh, Rajiv, for that wonderful input. And particularly, I would like to, you know, really uh, highlight the fact that your approach is very scientific. Because you have talked about, you know, validation of your hypothesis. And I'm glad to hear that all the hypotheses have been validated. So this is a scientifically tested model. And you have used it and you have transformed it during the COVID-19 situation into an online, you know, mode. That was uh, mind-boggling. That is really mind-boggling because, you know, uh, caregiving is always thought of as something which is personal one-to-one -one or in a community or in a neighborhood at a personal level. But now you have proved to us that it can be done even online. Okay. With these remarks... Thank you so much, Rajiv. Over to you, Moira. For please do uh, continue um, with your remarks, and then uh, I would like to just before uh, Moira uh, uh, comes in, I would like to just uh, present a brief bio of Moira. Just give me a couple of seconds. <coughs> What happened? Suddenly, my screen went up. Uh, oh, really? I don't know what That's happened. What Suddenly, my okay. Okay. Go ahead. yeah. Please kindly, okay. you know, just uh, go ahead. Okay. Um. I lost my screen. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I think I'd love to take just the lead from Jan Hively's yesterday because we had such a wonderful conversation. And it's so important to hear what you actually think. And my first question would simply be, um, do, you, do any of you think that this could be a project that you could carry on as a pilot in, in one of your areas? How did you react to this? And um, let's hear what you thought about it. To introduce myself, I'm Sam. Hello, Sam. Let's hear from you. Ah, we seem to have lost Sam. Yeah. Is there somebody else who'd like to speak while we're finding him? Hello. Hello. Yes. Sam, Sam go ahead. Can you go ahead? Uh, to, uh, to introduce myself, I'm Sam, uh, and I had done my research on uh, caregivers of persons with dementia, and I'm very much interested uh, to uh, to do this project 
in my agency. Uh, uh, this project can be done in institution or in the community. It is it is viable in the community, I feel, but it can we do in the institution? One question. Second question is, uh, can we uh, ease, ease the diagrams, male, female, uh, uh, then uh, is it uh, standardized? Uh, the figures, I, I want to know, is the figures are standardized? Then how to differentiate the informal care and the formal care in the diagram? Then I want to know uh, how stable is the care? Is there any difference in the lines? Actually, uh, this care map uh, is mimicking the family diagram. I feel like that. So some some changes can be done. I feel uh, uh, it is my opinion. Uh, yeah. on yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, yes. sir. Thank, Thank, you, sir. Sir. Thank, you, sir. Thank you, sir. Rajiv. So let me. Rajiv. Yeah, let me let me address that. One really, really fundamental thing about our work is that it is meant for people, not for professionals. And so when you ask the question, is it standardized? It has a very professional mindset. We are teaching people how to do it and we encourage them to change the diagram to suit their needs, which by definition, which end up being non-standardized. But what we care about is how does that person learn for himself, not whether it's so, as useful for the social worker, the doctor, the medical person. What we care about is empowering the individual to learn for themselves. And so we have purposely not standardized it in the sense that it's not standardizable. We're teaching people do what you think is best. We give them a starting point, but then we want to actually encourage variation. And it, it goes against the grain of kind of a professional mindset. And so one of the key ways that the care map is different from so many of these things that have come before is that they were designed with professionals in mind, and they're very standardized, very meticulous about how things are to be represented. We are not doing that. Um, and in that sense, often, you know, you ask about informal versus formal care, and it again has a very professional bias in the question. What we find when people draw their care maps is that the reality is hardly ever do professionals show up because they don't exist in our day-to-day -day lives for many people for most of their lives. Almost everything that shows up is what we call informal care, which in the real world is care. It's the human-to-human -human contact from your family, your friends, from your neighbors that's so much more important in our lives. And so many times, even the doctors don't show professionals when they draw their care map. And in terms of stability of care, part of a very key point in drawing your care map is it's of a moment in time. You might need to draw a different one tomorrow as circumstances change. And so recognizing that it's a snapshot. So there are people who have drawn care maps many times over the course of a year or over the course of a decade as a way of sort of recognizing and seeing how things are different. Likewise, they have often drawn kind of hypothetical future care maps to say, you know, what's it going to be when my child goes off to college? You know, uh, there's a person who has a child with autism who is actually functioning quite well at the moment in high school, but in a few years will go to college. How will the family help him do well when he's in a different town? So people are using it to think into the future that way. And so in terms of institutions, that's what I was saying was that when we work with institutions, we really are far more interested in working with institutions who recognize that the people in the institutions are human beings also, and they need to first learn these tools for themselves. They need to first discover their own humanity before they will be good at serving their patients and clients. Does that answer your question, Any other? sir? Who else would like to ask Rajiv a question? 
Hello, here I am uh, Rajesh Shukran. I am not asking questions, but just a clarification. Uh, the, thank you, Rajiv Mehta, sir, first of all, for your presentation. It was nice and wonderful. So what I infer from through your presentation, a simple, a flexible, and adapted to anyone who is willing to, you know, end up and to empower anyone at any time to develop this care method. Is that right, sir? So, so yes, that's so, right. So, uh, so, in that context, uh, I I think if this is uh, this developed uh, in a, in a global context. If this can be applied in a global context, I think uh, there is an, a scope for uh, the cost-effective community care. So, so that the, the, the community care giving will enhance its a fruitful impact uh, on the care uh, that what uh, where we serve the people. And definitely, one point uh, that really reminded me that the. The more important is the humanity. So, so the profession is there, professional competence is there, ethics is there, everything is there. But the priority is that the humanity, you know, uh, the humanitarian approach. So where it, it is like in Indian countries, they say that it is like a more of inclusive, so more of flexible, and uh, it, it is it is almost like a specific, individually a tailored uh, style. Whereby it is, it is one approach is successful with one person, as another kind of approach with another person. But now mind that there is a lot of flexibility. Thank you, thank you, Rajiv Matasa for uh, all your input. Uh, thanks. I hope many people uh, would be really would have benefited out of this. Thank you very much. Thank you. And yeah, I, I also just want to comment that. that excuse me. What, excuse me. Just want to respond to that. That one comment is that one of the things that makes this uh, globally useful is, and benefit of using pencil and paper, is that it can be in whatever language you want. So whether you're writing in Gujarati or in Spanish or, or in Chinese, it works. And um, anyway, thank you for your comments. Thank you, sir. Yes. Thank you, sir. May I, may I, may I, may I sir? Uh, so I am Muhammad Turab from MSI Hyderabad. Hello. Uh, I, thank, I thank you, Raju Mataji and Madam Moira Alan. There's too much of noise coming in. Mr. Mohammed. Do you think we can try again? Yeah. I think, Mr. Mohammed, you have to unmute yourself. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to come in? I think it's better to give, you know, uh, opportunity for all, I mean, for as many people as possible, because uh, we will not take up questions from the same person again and again. So right. Please bear with us. Um, we will go for other participants. Yeah. Is Mr. Mohammed still online? Would you still like to pose your question, Mr. Mohammed? Your mic is switched off. Yeah. Please go ahead. It's over, sir. It's over, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Please Hello? go ahead. It's over, sir. It's over. Yes. No, no, just I want to see. Okay, okay. No, I'm a, I'm a, I'm in years also associated with Alzheimer's Related Diseases Society of India, ARCRDI, dementia, and I'm very much interested in the subject. And this is the first opportunity attending this session. I would like to have uh, some more knowledge on your institution and the work. So I will be grateful if you can forward me so that I can have a detailed study of the organization and the work you have wonderfully done. 
Thank you so much. Yeah, I'll I'll put the um, the URL for the uh, the organization's website and my email in the chat. Sure. Thank you, Rajiv. Thank you. Rajiv. Who else would like to contribute? Who else would like to contribute? I'm sure there are many other participants who would like to come in with their comments and uh, questions. Is there any other question in the chat box, Hello? Hello? Is there any other question? Hello? Hello? Yes, I have a question. My name is Manoj. My name is Manoj. Please go. Go ahead, Manoj. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, caregiving is a problematic concept, especially in disability studies, right? So uh, now when you say that uh, care is commodified, especially when you, in the beginning of your sessions, you made a point that care industry. So people are concerned that in the process of commodifying care, you know, people lost that emotion. And now uh, we are moving to uh, care, technology assisted care. So there is a possibility that we are moving towards a post human society. How do you visualize what will be the nature and content of care in such post human society? Um, well, I don't know where to start with your question because I don't think I spoke about commodified care and um, I don't think we're moving to a post-human society. In fact, I think, if anything, we need to rediscover our humanity. Um, you know, we, we've sort of perhaps gotten too enamored of technology and professionals over the last hundred years or so, we, we need to rediscover the power of community and, and, and just human to human touch. And technologies are tools, they're, they're not replacements. Never mind that I'm in Silicon Valley and have led lots and lots of technology, but at the end of the day, they're tools, it's, it's us humans that are far more important. So I don't know how to answer your question because I think I'm in sympathy with your, with your perspective. Who else would like to? Are there any other questions or comments or? Um, in the meantime, uh, Rajiv, uh, one point, uh, you know, just wanted um, your input regarding that. It's related to what uh, Mr. Raj Shagran said earlier. You know, uh, it all boils down to humanity. I think, you know, the, when it comes to care, what matters most is the humane approach. And uh, I think there is a point in what Manoj said about, you know, the growing concern about commodifying care, uh, you know, commodification of caregiving services. Uh, it has become a reality now. Uh, you know, uh, and uh, there are also uh, uh, genuine uh, needs and uh, genuine, uh, you know, situations which warrant uh, you know, commercial or, you know, professional care for which you have to pay for, you have to pay for. Uh, so uh, these are, you know, really realities that we are confronted with. So how do you think the future is going to be, Rajiv, in, with your experience, you know, in mapping the caregiving resources uh, in, um, in the U.S. and also, uh, you know, maybe in other places? How do you think these caregivers map or this entire, you know, the, uh, what do you call that, uh, as your caregivers atlas, caregiving atlas, atlas of care. 
how do you think this address is going to change you know like people talk about the rising uh, rising levels of uh, the uh, sea and then they say the the geographic you know um, uh, atlas is going to change you know the the borders of countries are going to change because of you know uh, the the global warming and things like that so do you see do you foresee any change in the kind of atlas of care that you are talking about uh, or how is it going to be thank you yeah well in fact i mean part of this this all started because of this recognition of how poorly we understand the state of care in the home today we have very little data about it and it's unlikely that we will make great advances if we don't even understand the situation and so what we're trying to do is help people see much more clearly what is and once we see who knows what will come back from this in terms of what needs to be worked on or what can be done part of what we will discover hopefully is that we have far more resources at our disposal amongst our friends and family to better support us but we'll also see more clearly what is simply not doable by us similarly we may discover that the kinds of things that will make a big difference in our well-being have nothing to do with medicine it may have to do with the design of our homes it may have to do with the design of the environment it may have to do with the design of our work day you know we have sort of developed this work day system over the last 150 years which is a very kind of mechanized sort of thing you know you work 8 hours and and you're not at home which is not it does not fit the reality of our lives that you are responsible for your child and your mother 24 hours a day these 8 hours can't disappear and so so much of our lives today are not designed for our health and well-being in mind and you know one of the persons you know spoke about alzheimer and dementia and so forth part of what um you know we found many people who have dementia but aren't at the tail end of it are still functioning adults how can we more clearly see their capacities that still exist how do we help them live as richly as they can um and so there's a lot we can do there likewise i have a friend who has a children with autism you know which is a very serious issue and he has made tr- so much uh, advance in his children's health by actually getting rid of all sorts of um toxins in the home and what i mean by that is not just chemical toxins but he's made the sound much quieter he's taken out the clutter so it's a calm environment he's even changed his light bulbs to the ones that flicker much 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 less because like fluorescent flicker is really bad for children with autism and so forth so he's done all of these changes in his environment that have made a huge difference to people's health and he could only do that once he had kind of the data for health and wellness so it's hard to predict what the useful changes will be first we have to see and for that first we have to learn how to see yeah, yeah. that's wonderful uh, thank you rajiv uh, for that wonderful explanation just one quick point related to what you said uh, you know to, somewhere along your presentation you made a right observation that you know technology or the various gadgets are just gadgets are just tools you know we just kept saying that technology is just a tool but you know this covid 19 situation has made us all you know depend on technology and you know now you know we are spending more time at home with their gadgets and you know what happens is there's a lot of elder abuse taking place um there's a, a, a um Laura Mosquita is the dean of the medical school at USC in California in Los Angeles she's the the dean of the Keck School of Medicine and her focus her is on is on elder abuse her personal research 
is all around elder abuse. Um, you know, when she's not doing her dean things, when she's doing her research, it's around elder abuse. And she and her team are uh, using care maps in their work because they make the point that most elder abuse is not the result of people being malicious. It's that the caregiver is simply exhausted mentally, physically from being able to do the right things. And so sometimes does terrible things in mistake, sometimes does terrible things out of anger and frustration. And so they're not bad people. So can we use the care maps to start seeing their lives more richly and in fact see that they're so over capacity that, that in a sense it is predictable that elder abuse will happen. So let's not show up after the fact when now we have two victims, the elder and the caregiver. Let's see their situation early enough so that we can help the family. Um, you know, so that's an example. Uh, you know, it's hard to know until we start trying different things. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, the burnout, burnout. I think people experience burnout yeah. after caregiving for people for a long time. It, it's going to happen. I think basically the psychological concept of, you know, love and hate that comes to play when somebody is in a long-term caregiving relationship, as you rightly said, it, it's not that they are bad people, but it's just becoming a kind of a love and hate relationship, probably because of their, you know, stress and, uh, you know, a burden. Uh, thank you very much, Rajiv, for that. And uh, are there any other questions? I think Harish has a question to uh, Rajiv sir, can you hear me, sir? Rajiv sir, can you hear me, sir? Sir, can you hear me, sir? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Uh, sir, this is Arish from Mangalore City. Arish from Mangalore City. And uh, congratulations for your wonderful presentation, sir. It was very crisp and eye-opener. I would like to know one thing which is apart from your presentation. You know, like uh, be having a different background of your education qualifications, say like management and uh, aerospace engineering. What motivated you uh, to get into the field of aging, aging, sir? Um, so, well, one thing is that I'm not focused on the field of aging. I'm yeah. focused on how we people care for each other. And that includes you caring for your friends and not just your mother. You know, how you treat your friends and your family, how you treat your coworkers, how we really care for our friends and our neighbors and so forth. So it's, it's about care, not about aging. Um, but how did I get into this? It was, um, well, the short version of the story, I was investigating some very new wireless technologies, uh, which were very brilliant in the lab, but not very clear what use they were in the business world. Um, and in doing that, I was talking to people in the home health field in the telemonitoring to see whether this would be useful there. Uh, it turned out it wasn't, so that's the end of the technology story. But what people kept telling me about was uh, the problem, as they said, of non-compliance or non-adherence, that their patients wouldn't do what the doctors were telling them to do and so forth. And there was just a lot of complaints about us people being non-compliant. And so I asked them what the problem was and so forth. And they kept telling me that we people were very bad at following doctor's instructions or taking our pills or eating our food properly. And this was due to either us not understanding how important these things were or us simply prioritizing other things in life. Rather than exercise, we'll sit on the couch and watch a movie. And while they were explaining that, I would say... I, from a technology perspective, have nothing to offer you, so good luck to whatever you're doing. But the more I heard this, the more I started feeling that that blaming us people was really misguided, that what we are being asked to do is actually so, so, so much more complex than is being appreciated. And so that if we were going to help people have better health and well-being, we actually had to understand what they were trying to do and how could they do it in the context of their lives. And so it began with me simply researching how do we people care for ourselves? And, you know, 
from the obvious point of view, in my mind, it was like, well, almost all care is done by us for us. You know, it's like 99.9% .9 of care is done by us. And we're all alive, so we're doing okay. Um, so why are we being blamed so much for ill health when we're doing everything? So it was that mindset that got me started in this field, and um, which gives you no explanation for why I would keep pursuing it. But never mind, that's, that's how I got started on this. It's good, sir. Thank you. It's good, sir. Thank you. Are there any other questions or any other remarks or would you like to come in with any other remarks or would you like to um, add, add to what, uh, you know, others have spoken? Hello. Yeah. Hello. Uh, yeah. Is there a question? Yeah, please go ahead. Yes, Sam, go ahead. Yeah. Sam, you're you're muted. Hello. Hello. Yes. Hello, I am Professor Lazar Mahila. Is it audible? Okay. Is it audible? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. yeah. I. Hi. Good evening to everybody. I'm very. Oh, it is a very wonderful talk. I have this opportunity. I thank Dr. Ilango for having given me this opportunity. It is true that now under this post-COVID scenario, there is a lot of need for the propagation of the concept of our care industry, and then. Uh, not only the commercial care, at the same time, the charity care also. Because of this COVID, it has terrified everybody and people are not uh, taking care of the world people especially. So this uh, webinar has given us an opportunity to promote the humanity among other, others and as well as uh, all the academia uh, to think about uh, how best we can contribute in different parts of this country as well as across the world to try for promoting uh, this care industry. If you see the two days back in uh, Andhra Pradesh, now uh, one person was died on the road itself. For three hours, the relatives, they didn't touch the body, thinking that they may get the uh, coronavirus. So this is the situation, uh, how uh, uh, pathetic it is. It should not happen like that. Uh, definitely it will happen in future when people are uh, worrying about their own lives, forgetting about these uh, emotions, etc. Uh, in this regard, uh, this kind of seminars will give us a kind of thing, uh, how best we can uh, promote uh, this kind of care industry. And on this uh, GATS also, and during this globalization, there is a lot of opportunities also for uh, uh, this hospitality and the care industry. I thank once again uh, Professor uh, Rajiv Mehta for uh, this excellent talk, and I thank uh, Professor Ilango for having me given this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Rajiv Mehta. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Or Moira? Moira, would you like to <coughs> come in? Yes, sir. Well, last question, sir. Last question, sir. Uh, I think this care mapping is bringing the people from the home, the community to institution. Is it like that? Uh, and also, I have another question. Is this uh, a care mapping bring them, uh, bring the caregivers to the respite care? Um, so, in some cases, so when we have people draw their care maps and we ask them to reflect on what they have drawn, one of the questions we ask them to reflect on is, are there other services that would be helpful? And so if they identify that and there are such services available, then that helps build that gap. And so in that sense, it does help people come to these services that are available. Um, of course, they both need to recognize that they have a need and the services need to be accessible, but at least this helps make that more clear. Um, and then, you know, the, the thing is that, um, that sometimes people 
are unaware of their own needs in the sense that self-reflection doesn't happen like that. You know, it doesn't happen instantly. It takes time. And the conversations that you have with your family members, with the people you trust, with your neighbors, are in many ways really, really important because as a collective, you may be more aware of things that are available. So it's not just the individual, but having the conversation as a community ends up being what's, what's really valuable. And then somebody in the community may be aware that, oh, yeah, there's such and such society that can help you with that. So that becomes important. I think you're muted. Is there any scope? Is there any scope for identifying people with elder abuse? Well, as I was saying earlier, uh, Professor Laura Mosquita at the University of Southern California is, in fact, uh, studying how can she use care maps to predict uh, possible cases of elder abuse. And it, you know, to simplify it, it really comes down to identifying caregivers that are overwhelmed. There is just, you know, and in terms of respite care, one of the most important things that we have discovered from our work is if what the families are doing is as complex as our data is showing, then it's, it's not reasonable to expect that even a trained nurse coming into the home can do a good job because they just don't know the situation. And so respite care in a practical sense only works if the person coming in to provide respite is deeply knowledgeable about the situation. And that's only possible if it's the same person who's coming regularly. So you can't simply have a staff of expert nurses, any of whom might show up, it needs to be the same person. And which makes many people in the US often don't make use of respite care that is available to them because the way they say it, it's like, it takes me four hours of preparation to get one hour of respite. This is not worth the trouble. And so respite is both really, really important and really, really hard to get right. The Tilanga. Are there are there any more questions? I think we've come up to the end of our time. Is there any online course for for Indians uh, to practice uh, the karma? Is there, there is information is about it? how to draw the care map online on our website, which I posted earlier. It's, it's easy to find. Uh, there's very simple, straightforward instructions for drawing your care map. <clears throat> I think I've doc um, I can't see Dr. Elango. Right. Well, Moira, we should probably call time on this anyway. I think so, yes. I think, I think so, so, too. Um, just as a closing word from myself, I'd just like to thank Raji particularly. He's just been outstanding like I've always known him. And he did get out of bed like at 4.30 this morning to be with us. And that, <laughs> that was really very good. From the Pasatan Network, I hope that this is a start of many, many um, webinars like this because we have the privilege of knowing expert people around the world. And it seems to have been a very profitable in engagement. So I would like you all just to pass on what you've learned today. And it would be such a joy to see projects coming out of India with Rajiv. Thank you so much to everybody, to Professor Ilango and to everybody present. Thank you so much. Rajiv, would you like to just say goodbye? Yes, well, thank you all for listening in this morning. I'm, I'm glad many of you had good questions to ask, made me think. And uh, please follow up with anything that you have. Um, any other questions through Professor Longo, through um, through Moira, or just through uh, the email that I put in the chat box? Thank you very much. Okay. okay. And Professor Gandharan, do you want to say a few words? Okay.
Can you unmute yourself, please? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so thanks a lot, uh, uh, Rajiv, for coming so early in the morning. I can imagine getting up at 3.30, 4 o'clock to get ready for this. It could be quite uh, stressful. But ne nevertheless, the way that you spoke, you didn't look like one who got up so early. And uh, keeping everyone, uh, you know, absolutely on uh, pin drop silence. And uh, except here and there, some people were waking you up to say, come on, uh, we are going to make you some noise. But thanks a lot. Uh, it's been wonderful. I think yesterday and today uh, has been a huge learning. And I'm, I'm very sure that as we are progressing towards Center for Gerontology, taking a good shape, uh, I'm very sure we will have more interactions to come for, you know, uh, interact. And we would be very grateful if you can really come, come, keep coming to us for more programs whenever we are finding time and you are finding time to do that. Moira, it's been wonderful uh, being part of you. I've never known anything about uh, Pasiton Network till Dr. Ilango told me about it three weeks ago. And I understand you also have a good network in India. I'm able to see Dr. Joshi from Banaras also sitting here. And nice to know some of these people I meet in this group in the process. And I look forward to seeing you all once again. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. and Mrs. Gazella for being with us all through. Thank you once again. Thank you, everybody. All right, bye everyone. Bye-bye. 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 Thank Dr. Gangadharan. <laughs> <laughs>